a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very profound. Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this very, very special episode, guys, Dr. Rick Strassman comes by to talk about his new book, The Psychedelic Handbook, a practical guide to psilocybin, LSD, ketamine, MDMA, and DMT and ayahuasca. Fascinating read, guys. This is awesome. Dr. Rick Strassman, of course, in 2012, wrote the breakthrough book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and has been absolutely crushing it in the psychedelics game ever since. So on this episode, guys, we talk about, of course, set and setting, why he wrote the book, uh, what are psychedelics and how effective are they, his thoughts on the increased popularity and availability of psychedelics, some of the dangers, of course, medieval metaphysics, which is awesome. You guys are going to love it. Also, he finds salvia as weird as shit as I do, which I think is absolutely awesome. We also cover, of course, food of the gods, uh, the stoned ape theory, and all sorts of crazy cool stuff, guys. So... All the ways to find him, of course, are going to be located down in the show notes. Make sure that you check that out. While y'all are down there as well, check out expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is our website. It is our central hub for everything. That's where links to all the socials go, merchandise, all that cool stuff. Merch is changing also, guys. I announced on the last show. So if you got something out there that you like, go ahead and snatch it up or... It's, it's all changing anyway, so go ahead and uh, snatch it up if there's something that you like on there. Also, while you're down in the show notes, if you are just like, man, this, this show is incredible. How do I support? How do I you know, become more involved? Become an expansive insider. That is where all the bonus stuff is, the panel shows, the cool collaborations, all the cool stuff, guys, is happening over there. And it is a wonderful way to support the show as well. If you just want to support without signing up to become an expansive insider, there is a link in the show notes titled Support the Mission. That's the best way to do that. Every little bit helps. And thank you guys so much for participating in Value Exchange. It just lights me up to no no other. So thank you all so much. Also, an announcement to make really quick, super exciting. Uh, Go check out the link in the show notes uh, titled Secret Space UFOs. That is the brand new documentary by Darcy Weir. Amazing filmmaker. He crushed it with this one. I mean, absolutely crushed it. It's so cool to watch Darcy grow as a filmmaker, but also uh, not only is Richard Dolan in this bad boy, but your boy right here is in this bad boy. So uh, at the end of the video version of this episode right here, I'll play the trailer in full. So check the show notes for the video version of this, and that's how you can watch the trailer. Also, it's over there on Amazon. So y'all go check it out. It's called Secret Space UFOs, NASA's First Missions. This was a blast to do. And Darcy, thank you so much, man. Really, you crushed it on this one, dude. So well done. All right, guys, so let's get to this incredibly cool conversation with Dr. Rick Strassman. Welcoming to the show, we have Dr. Rick Strassman, the great and powerful. Man, how are you? I'm good. Uh, Thanks for having me on today. Outstanding, of course. How can I not? Uh, Your 2012 book, uh, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. I digested that thing, absolutely loved it, Uh, fellow psychonaut myself. And so to hear about how it, I mean, just the process to get this passed, because it's a scheduled one, was insane. And so I'm grateful you detailed it in the book, and then as well as just all the experiences that folks had. I think this is fascinating, man. Um, So you are just crushing it at Psychedelic Research. Your new book, The Psychedelic Handbook, will of course be located down in the show notes, guys. Definitely check this thing out. A Practical Guide to Psilocybin LSD, Ketamine, MDMA, and DMT and ayahuasca. Uh, what made you want to write this bad boy? It's awesome. Love it, by the way. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, well, it seemed like a good time for a little textbook that packs as much information as possible into uh, an accessible, reader-friendly, uh, but authoritative uh, you know, guidebook to learning about psychedelics, what they are, how they work, what they do, what they don't do, um, the, the different drugs themselves. I include, uh, 
I include Ibogaine in there as well as mescaline and 5-methoxy DMT and also salvia, but there are only, you know, so many words we could put in the subtitle. Um, you know, so the longest chapter in the book is how to trip, uh, you know, how to get yourself ready and uh, make sure everything is going to go well. And I talk about the law and microdosing. You know, there's a lot of hype. Uh, there's a lot of um, things being said, oh, that uh, kind of promote a panacea-like approach to psychedelics and minimize uh, potential adverse effects. And I wanted to you know, kind of balance the you know, presentation uh, by emphasizing how you know, powerful these drugs are and uh, how uh, you need to think uh, you know, clearly about taking them or giving them. It's a great point. I think it's not pointed out enough. I think a lot of people think, oh, psychedelics, oh, this is going to be fun. But I mean, things like ayahuasca, that's not a party drug. You, you, it's it's medicine. And so it, it's just viewed very differently, uh, especially when it comes to the drug culture, I guess, if we want to put it. But psychedelics, in my mind, are in a category all of their own. So what are psychedelics and what do they do from your perspective? Well, that could be sort of expanded at a number of levels. I mean, subjectively, uh, they uh, affect every aspect of the mind, the human mind, uh, one's emotions, perceptions, visual, auditory, uh, somatic effects, your sense of your body, uh, you know, volitional kind of you know, sense of self, uh, thinking processes and content. You know, so they you know, basically modify every aspect of consciousness, as opposed to, let's say, uh, stimulants, which only affect maybe one or two, or sedatives, uh, but psychedelics affect the whole range. Uh, th they are well. If if you kind of translate psychedelic, it means mind manifesting or mind disclosing, which I think is the broadest, most generic description of their effects. I think they bring to light or make more meaningful or you know, con convey a conviction of the reality sense of what's already in your mind, in 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 your psyche. Yeah, you know, that's not to say those things in your mind are now conscious, but th they do reside there in some form or another. They might be forgotten memories or intellectual associations that you hadn't thought of before, but were potential in your mind. Um, you know, so they. Uh, accompanying or as a vehicle of that information, uh, that manifestation of your mind, uh, there are you know, visions, you know, voices, uh, loss of body awareness, you can travel through space, extreme emotions or no emotions at all, um, or a combination of emotions. Um, so they work biologically on certain receptors in the brain, the serotonin uh, ones. Uh, their effects on the brain kind of are, uh, you know, kind of what you would expect based on subjective experience. There are certain things which are made more conscious. Uh, there, are new, uh, there are new ways of the brain communicating with different centers. Uh, you know, so you know, we're looking at them or they have been looked at in a lot of different ways. They can be psychotherapeutic, they can be spiritual, they can be fun. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, when you ask what is a, uh, you know, like, uh, it's a lot of things. I mean, even uh, breathing techniques can put you in this state. Hot saunas for a while can put you in this state. Near-death experiences can put you in a psychedelic type state. Meditations as well. So there it seems to be a few different avenues or roads that will lead you to some extraordinary experiences that, yes, reside in the realm of subjectivity for the most part. You have people uh, that take very similar amounts of things on similar doses, similar body weights. And I know you discovered this in your research, right? That no two trips are identical or even really that similar, really. There's some common elements but so is that what you found was just a diversity of experiences well it seemed to take people uh, well in terms of giving dmt um 
it uh, seemed to cause a similar phenomenological effects, like you know the visions were similar, the physical effects were similar, the emotional effects were uh, were similar. That, you know, they were quite strange. I mean, it would be like the psychic equivalent of going to, you know, India for the first time and not having any idea what to expect. Um, you know, but the individual, you know, the the the, uh, the meaning uh, of the experiences, uh, the specific symbolism and interactions uh, in that state were specific to the person. Um, for example, a software designer saw the source of zeros and ones, an urban shaman um, had a, a death rebirth experience, uh, someone who with, with a long-standing interest in the near-death state had a near-death experience, uh, somebody with an interest in the mystical state had a mystical experience. There were a couple of cases of you know, trauma you know, being healed either emotionally or physically. Um, you know, so even though the you know, surface features of the DMT experience were quite similar uh, among the volunteers, the specific you know, content and uh, its relationship to that person were unique to that person, uh, which is the reason that I think you know, psychedelic is the most appropriate term. Um, you know, there are other terms for these drugs, mystical, mimetic, entheogenic, uh, you know, uh, psychotomimetic, hallucinogenic. Uh, but, you know, those all emphasize one potential set of outcomes. Um, I think uh, the, a term which encompasses them all is psychedelic. Why do you think in your mind that the individual has such subjective, as you said, if they're researching near-death experiences, that's what they have. Anything they're obsessed with, angels and demons, they'll, they'll come up with some version of that. Have you been able to reconcile that within yourself? Uh, well, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the drugs are only, uh, there's, there's nothing other than you that the drugs are working on. You know, so it, with one set of experiences already under your belt, or an interest in the near death state, let's say, or um, an interest in solving a professional problem, for example, you know, those are things that your mind is full of. And the psychedelic makes more meaningful, more true, more real certain ways of looking at those things which are already in your mind and if there are certain uh, c contents of your mind that occupy it a lot of the time uh, then that's what's going to come up uh, during your trip yeah, it's interesting. It, uh, it rings the bells of like Dr. Lynn McTaggart's work with the intention studies. What they were intending is what occurred. And so this this makes sense when you go on a psychedelic experience, especially with this this type of experience. It's pretty wild on any of these, honestly. There's a variety of different ones that you talk about in here, and I love this. So actually, I was just curious for me personally, what's your favorite? Like just one you enjoy the most? The one I enjoy the most? Uh, well, I don't trip that much these days, but... Um... You know, I used to like LSD a lot uh, in my 20s, uh, late teens, early 20s. You need a lot of energy to get through a full LSD trip. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I enjoyed that. I was young, vigorous, uh, just kind of be out all day. Um, I've liked psilocybin. I went through a stage of really enjoying uh Ayahuasca, uh, you know, drinking it with one of the you know, federally approved Brazilian-based uh, you know, churches out here. I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I don't have much experience with ketamine. And uh, you know, to be honest, I haven't done DMT, smoked DMT that many times. Uh, but, you know, the first time kind of got me into studying DMT. MDMA... I'm not crazy about. 
<laughs> salvia is horrible. At least I found it horrible. Yes, right? Okay, what, what are your thoughts on salvia? I thought it was so weird, man. And I'm a psychonaut. Like you, I used to do a lot a lot of acid. Again, in the 20s is when you do this thing. You know, an MDMA and acid, it's called candy flipping for the kids out there. That's That was one of my favorite things because it took kind of the harshness off of the LSD, to be honest with you. But you need like three days to recover, even in your 20s. So what's up with salvia, man? What were your thoughts? Well, um, you know, I think I treat it fairly in the book. It's the shortest uh, uh, chapter uh, in that section. Um, you know, I just describe its pharmacology. It has a unique pharmacology. It stimulates the kappa opioid receptor as opposed to the serotonin one uh, type, uh, the, the serotonin type two. Um, but the subjective effects are very unsettling for most people, even though apparently there are people that really uh, like salvia. Uh, there's been a couple of studies, one at Harvard, one at Hopkins, uh, and they recruited people that enjoy taking salvia. Uh, you know, but it isn't uncommon for people to say, I'm never using that again. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, it's really disorienting because it completely changes this reality. Yeah. Um, you know, things are like, you know, I've got a rug there, my computer's there, there's a lamp there. Things just start to get really strange in your world. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, there's a feeling of a catastrophe uh, as well that seems to accompany it. Uh, you know, uh, I smoked it in the early 90s when it was the the, the pure uh, you know, substance was discovered to be smokable um, as opposed to just you know sublingual. Uh, so we were some of the earlier experimenters, uh, you know, scouts with that drug, and I way overdosed. I took way too much, um, and I was lying on the bed, and a hole opened up in the ceiling, and a man, 40 feet tall, wearing a brown suit. And in a brown derby or a uh, you know, bowler hat, looked down at me and said, "It's time to go now." And he started to you know, pull me into his pant leg, uh, starting you know mostly with my arm, which was flying off, you know, particles, you know, joining into his pant leg. And I was just terrified. I thought, "What the hell is this?" Um, yeah, my poor wife. Well, I was married at the time. That may have contributed to the end of the marriage. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, I was really kind of out of it for, a, you know, half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, yeah, and was pretty unsettled for a few days later. Yeah, I would say so. And that's a long salvia trip. Yeah, you did take quite a bit. Mine was like 15 minutes, man. And my thing, like you said, it, it's it's not like psilocybin or anything like that to where it makes like, <clears throat> you know, things breathe or objects that you're familiar with, stationary things. You're like, yes, the cup is there. Yeah, it's moving and it's doing its thing, but it's there. My experience was like, I pictured the people in the room with me turned immediately into... You know those posable, uh, faceless figures that people use for art, you know, and they're kind of like posable, but they're just faceless and they're just so that people can figure out how bodies are constructed and draw off of it. Everyone in the room turned into one of those. And then they started folding, like their appendages started folding like pieces of paper. And then I came back to baseline. It was wild, man. And so same thing. I've got one under my belt and that's it. Not to say never again, but it was so shockingly odd. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's this very strange mixture of uh, a hallucinatory state and you know this state. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, next question for you then would be: uh, What did you discover writing this book that you were previously unaware of? Uh, the main thing that really struck me was, despite my thinking, I was pretty current on all of these. Uh, you know, drugs, the theories, the pharmacology around them. Once I really you know, sat down you know, to write the book, I was amazed at the advances uh, that had taken place the last uh, you know, two or three years, uh, you know, both within the clinical research uh, world, the political world, uh, the commercial media approach. Yeah, things have really taken off the last couple of years. 
Yeah, it's pretty interesting how popular it's gotten. So that was another question I had for you. So with this, I just want to know your thoughts on its increase in popularity and availability. What do you think about that? Well, it is a mixed bag. I mean, you know, there were I had two schools of you know, thought in in uh, you know the '60s about uh, you know psychedelic accessibility. You know, who should take them? Who should be allowed to take them? You know, there was an elitist uh, uh, you know, party, uh, Frank Hurd, Aldous Huxley, um, and the more egalitarian uh, folks out there like Tim Leary and Ken Kesey, who you know, believed everybody should get stoned, you know, pretty much. Um, and uh, if if it weren't for, for Tim Leary and Ken Kesey, a lot of people would not have uh, you know, taken psychedelic drugs for the good. Uh, but at the same time, there were a lot of uh, problems with indiscriminate use uh, and people that weren't well prepared. Um, emergency room visits, psychiatric hospitalizations, suicides, accidents, those kinds of things. Um, you know, so I think there'll be more people tripping, which will, you know, hopefully overall be a good thing. And an increasing number of uh, you know, casualties, adverse effects. Uh, so um, I think we need to be a little more prepared for adverse effects than we seem to be. Uh, we are, or, you know, there's a tendency to really, you know, glorify potential benefits and to minimize uh, problems. So a more balanced approach will come in handy when those problems, you know, start to emerge and, you know, garner some attention. You know, it's an interesting perspective. Now, uh, the first time I ever did LSD, I was 18, took two hits of liquid acid, uh, never done any psychedelic ever before. And uh, I had a horrible, horrible, horrible trip. One of these famous things of, you know, the puking everywhere, the crying, like very scared, very just shook up. Now, I didn't have anybody to help me out with that. Uh, I was pretty on my own with it, but I still found the experience incredibly valuable. So it's, it's this idea of having these horrible experiences. And I think a lot of us can empathize with this, that on the other side of some pretty extreme things in your life, not necessarily even psychedelics, that is when you have your greatest awarenesses and breakthroughs. So th on the other side of these crap trips, you know, are some value, you know? So do you think that, that, that that's accurate, that there's value in all trips, good and bad? Uh, no, I think there are some bad trips that are just, you know, bad. They'll, you know, trigger some major problem or, you know, uh, like an accident or, you know, anxiety that just never goes away or flashbacks or, you know, depression that's really hard to treat. Um, but I think it is possible to work through a bad trip. I, I think you can have a, a bad trip and, you know, depending on your resources, um, your personal resources and your social network, you can turn a bad trip into good like the next day let's say uh or as you're coming down and you're getting you know talked down and feel better you know but at least or you know for sure you know the following days if you still feel on shaky ground um you know if you have a way to understand it and to kind of work with it to metabolize it and if you have a supportive environment too uh you can learn from a bad trip but i don't think it's uh it's it's automatic that, that that happens that's fair you need to work on it and have help yeah and you know just as you're talking through this uh, uh, why don't they have a hotline or a service like that to where you can have integration um after to where you can talk about it with somebody well there is actually uh, the fireside something or another it's a uh you know 24 7 hotline really okay awesome yeah it's been around a few years and they're getting better and better Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. And then I'll link it down in the show notes so that you guys can check it out. Also, I'm going to be linking uh, your conversation over on uh, Ascension of the Chessmen. I'm rocking the shirt today. Thank you, Andre, for hooking us up. And uh, so another question I had for you is, do you think psychedelics are for everybody? Oh, no. I don't think so. At the same time, I think people who want to you know, try them ought to be able to. 
I completely agree with that. I saw up in uh, Canada, isn't it? Now they have a dispensary. I saw uh, Dennis McKenna posted something about that the other day, that they have their first psilocybin uh, dispensary up there. And I thought that was really cool. So do you think that that's where we're going with this, that they're just going to become more accepted and more legal? Oh, man. Yeah, to be honest, I hope not. I, I mean, you know, uh, you know, what if your you know, 10-year-old kid wants to go into a you know, psilocybin dispensary or he finds somebody who's, you know, 20 and says, hey, man, can you buy me some mushrooms? Um, yeah, I think there needs to be some regulations. Uh, yeah, and I think there ought to be you know, places where people can trip safely for the reason that they want to trip. Uh, you know, so I think just, you know, going in, you know, buying mushrooms and saying, you know, see, uh, I think a lot of people have a good time, but I think it, you know, puts other people at risk that wouldn't, you know, uh, necessarily need to be at risk if accompanying the accessibility were facilities and facilitators who could, you know, supervise you know, people's sessions. It's going on already un underground. Uh, you've got sitters and, you know, the shamanic, uh, you know, culture, uh, you know, people facilitate sessions. Um, but, you know, to do it above board, you know, legally have the state certified and all that, um, there's nothing quite yet going on, uh, although they're working you know, hard in the state of Oregon to get you know, psilocybin centers up and running by January mm. um, with a whole state you know, regulatory uh, you know, bureaucracy to you know, hopefully minimize adverse effects at the very least. Yeah, yeah, it's an awesome point. Awesome point. Uh, so let me ask you, what are some of the dangers? You know, we touched on these just a little bit. So some of the dangers that we can come across if you're out there uh, imbibing in psychedelics for the first time, anybody out there's first time user, what's some something to look out for? Well, you need to be in good health, or if you're on any medication or you know, suffering you know, from any illness that you think through what you're going to be doing. Uh, and you know, consider whether what you're thinking of taking would uh, not combine well with either your medication or your health. You know, for example, if you have um, a history of stroke or or a, or a history of heart attack, um, you wouldn't want to smoke DMT or you know, five methoxy DMT you know, because they both really increase heart rate and blood pressure and can cause problems if you've got heart disease or cerebrovascular disease. Um, you know, so that's an example of uh, you know, medical stuff with respect to tripping. Um, uh, you know, if the possibility of adverse effects. Um, you know, psychologically, uh, adverse effects are uh, the ones which occur, you know, within the mind, you know, primarily. Uh, you know, Terrence McKenna used to say, you can never die from, you know, psychedelics you know, physically, but you could uh, from astonishment. You could die from astonishment. Uh, and you can, you know, go crazy from astonishment, develop panic attacks as a result thereof. So uh, I, I think you could divide adverse effects into um, um, acute, short-term, and long-term, and mild, medium, and severe. You know, so, you know, like any other, uh, you know, medical side effect, like, you know, penicillin, skin rashes, or... Uh, you know, diarrhea from certain drugs, uh, high blood pressure. Um, so, uh, you know, most people experience, uh, you know, some acute anxiety uh, at, you know, some time uh, during a psychedelic drug experience. Um, and if it's, if, if it's intense, you know, teeth grinding anxiety or you break out in a cold sweat, you could call that, uh, you know, brief, you know, you know, mild, you know, to moderate episode of anxiety acutely. If you're, you know, suicidal, let's say in the middle of a trip, that would be more severe. If whatever was going on extended, let's say 24 or, you know, 48 hours after you've come down, then you would call that short term. And anything that goes on a week or so, you would you know, consider t to be long term. Um, you can have anxiety afterwards. You can have depression. 
you can have low energy. Uh, if you have a propensity to certain mental illnesses like mania or depression or schizophrenia, um, a big trip can uh, you know, trigger an episode, especially if it's a unpleasant experience. Um, I, you know, so it's a whole I, you know spectrum of effects. You know, from just brief, uh, you know, short-term, immediate anxiety at some point during the trip, or you know, prolonged psychosis. Uh, you know, so um, it just depends. What about uh, set and setting? We talked about it a second ago uh, with trip sitters with these environments and these places. Like, let's say you can have a dispensary and then um, enjoy there. I like that. Kind of like a big discovery zone for adults, right? Like a ball pit and nice and colorful and cool music and all that stuff. So uh, talk to us about set and setting and why is it important? Well, um, set is who you are, uh, your mental state, your, uh, your physical state, um, your your previous experience with altered states of consciousness, including those brought on, you know, by psychedelics. Uh, and I think most important, it's your intention. Um, why you want a trip? Is it for fun? Uh, is it for introspection? Is it for enjoying, um, you know, places of indoor or outdoor beauty? Uh, is it you know, to interact with people therapeutically or uh, you know, socially, yeah. So, the, um, you know, the intention is really important, uh, a part of the set, and I think it's important to spend some time uh, working on your intention and you're clarifying it. You're setting things up so you can work on it when you're tripping as well. Your setting is everything else external. It's the environment, indoor, outdoor. Um, it's also you know the set of the people in your immediate vicinity are they friends are they strangers they they people that uh, are studying you or are you studying them uh, is it a research um uh, kind of setting um you know morning evening uh in uh you know nighttime um you know, so there's three legs to any psychedelic experience. There's the set and the setting and the drug. You know, so the drug would you know, be the specific uh, you know, drug. Uh, are you interested in, you know, let's say you know, something you know, solitary and you know, short term, which would be one of the, like the smokable tryptamines, or you know, like a, a, a you know, long haul with LSD. Uh, if if it's going to be ibogaine, you need to be in a uh, you know clinic in order you know, to minimize any medical uh, you know problems. You know, so it's the set um, and uh, the setting and the drug and the dose of the drug. Uh, if you want a small trip, take a smaller dose. Uh, if you're inexperienced, want to just you know kind of try it out. Uh, you know, if um, you want a more intense trip, you would take a uh, uh, you, you take a larger dose. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, so that's, uh, you know, kind of the tripod, you know, the set and the setting and the substance, you know, including the dose. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's talk about some psychedelics and how they're used. And then let's talk about how effective they are. So um, what is what's some of that? So just some psychedelics, like how are they used? Like what's one of the ways in which psychedelics are important and useful? Um, well, medically is uh, where most of the attention is going these days. Uh, and uh, th there's quite strong evidence of benefit in depression, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, tobacco and alcohol abuse, uh, end of life despair, you know, those are the main conditions for which we've got, uh, you know, some good uh, rigorous data. Uh, there's, you know, quite a few other, uh, you know, potential indications, but uh, they haven't really been studied uh, in a you know, double-blind, placebo-controlled manner. You know, there is you know, just a study uh, using LSD you know, for anxiety as well it came out a few months ago. And you know, like all the other uh, st you know, studies out there indicated some benefit.
It's incredible. Um, okay, so you have a section in your book. If you don't mind, I'd just like to for you to talk to us about it. Medieval metaphysics. Oh yeah, man, that's cool. If you don't mind, sir. Well, it's pretty deep into the woods and I uh, into the weeds, and I you know, do tell people, please skip over if your eyes start to cross. <laughs> um, well, it's um, one of the models of the mind that I use to explain how. Um, you know, psychedelics work, you know, what they do. Uh, I've got one chapter in there which discusses the biology, the pharmacology, you know, the brain functional imaging. Uh, um, all of that is, uh, you know, it, it's objective data. You could look at it, other people can look at it. Um, you know, the next uh, you know, chapter describing mechanism of action uh, approaches things psychologically. So I introduce the three models that I'm most familiar with, um, with respect you know, to the mind on um, how it works and what uh, you know, psychedelics you know, could be doing. Um, one of those is, you know, the Freudian unconscious, subconscious, ego, id, uh, you know, super ego model. Uh, the other is the you know, Buddhist Abhidharma psychology, uh, which you know, um, uh, you know, breaks mental experience down into a number of you know, manageable categories. And you could speculate or hypothesize that you know, psychedelics are modifying the you know, function of those uh, interacting mental mechanisms. Um, and the third one is um, you know, medieval metaphysics. Uh, and I you know, got into that while I was working on my book on prophetic states, uh, DMT and the and the soul of uh, prophecy, which came out in 2014. Um, you know, so this is a model that uh, harkens back to Aristotle of the Greeks a long, long, long time ago, which was then uh, uh, you know, translated by. You know, of the Muslim philosophers into Arabic, and you know, then from Arabic into Hebrew. Uh, you know, so the Jews, uh, you know, learned about Aristotle, uh, you know, through the Muslims, and this was in the you know, seven hundreds or so, and the eight hundreds, you know, the beginning of um, of Arabic uh, you know, philosophical uh, growth. Um, and uh, the Jewish medieval philosophers have got a system of you know, how a you know, prophetic experience takes place, and your know, prophecy is extremely psychedelic. If you look at descriptions of the accounts of the prophets, for example, you know, chapter one of Ezekiel is completely psychedelic. There's angels with wings and eyes on the backs of the wings, and fire and ice, and uh, you know, falling down uh, from. Uh, you, uh, you know, from weakness, um, you know, so it's extremely psychedelic. And, you know, the philosophers worked out a way of understanding the, uh, the visions uh, that occur in the prophetic state, which are quite, you know, similar, you know, to the visions which occur in uh, the psychedelic state. Um, so their model um, is based on uh, you know, dividing the mind into the imaginative faculty or function and the rational or intellectual uh, you know, faculty or uh, you know, function. Um, so the intellect is the location of and the place in which uh, you know, there's manipulating of ideas and concepts and notions. You know, mathematics, uh, you know, for example, the imagination is uh, the location of everything else in mental experience, your emotions, uh, your sensations, um, your bodily awareness, um, even the meaningfulness or the reality nature of experience is determined or felt within the imagination. You know, so it isn't imagination as made up or make believe. It's more the imagination as opposed to the intellect. Uh, you know, so the intellect is where th there's ideas and the 
imagination is where there's experience, I suppose you could say, um, you know, palpable, perceptible, apprehensible experience. Uh, you know, so I think, anyway, uh, that you know, psychedelics stimulate the imagination much more than they do the intellect. Because, for example, in my study of DMT, you know, people were able to really describe the novelty and the bizarreness of the DMT state in great detail. They could say it looked like this, it sounded like this, that there was this, I felt that. Um, but if you compare those descriptions with what they got information-wise from the state, the information content was really quite ordinary. It was simply them working on themselves, like job issues, or they became more convinced of the paths of you know, validity that their life was taking, um, or they uh, were able to work through uh, you know, trauma. It was all quite personal. You know, so, you know, so the information within the prophetic state uh, as at least as articulated in the Hebrew Bible, is the most important aspect of the prophecy. You know, people don't remember, you know, Moses' visions, you know, but remember you know, the commandments and the golden rule and things like that. You know, so the visions you know, convey the most important uh, you know, part of the prophetic experience, which is the information. You know, so at least in you know, my book about prophetic states, I you know, suggest that uh, you know, psychedelics primarily stimulate the imagination. And in order to get the most out of the stimulated imagination, you also need to work on the intellect at you know, the same time. In other words, you know, fill your mind with good ideas and good thoughts and good beliefs, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, like affirmations, you know, spiritual affirmations. Um, and, it, 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 um, you know, studying spiritual, uh, you know, texts um, as well will develop the intellect. And you can gain some tools in extracting information from the imagination with intellectual sorts of tools that you've learned about through study. Um, you know, so basically, uh, it's a way of uh, encouraging people to live good lives and think good thoughts before they trip, um, in which case they'll get the most out of their experiences. Absolutely. And whenever you're talking about <clears throat> prophecy and, and things like, I'm, I'm grateful you brought up Moses and the burning bush, because that's very psychedelic uh, to me as well. Like you said, with the Ezekiel's will, and there's some kind of conjecture that it was an acacia bush that was burning, which is very prevalent to that area. Uh, but the whole thing is very interesting. And then I think of things like uh, the uh, Oracle of Delphi. Whenever <clears throat> she's tripping on these fumes off the mountain, then she's relaying these prophecies. But we just talked about how subjective the psychedelic experience is and how personal it is and how it's filtered through your and it's very for you. So then you would ask, well, then how was any of the information relevant for anyone else if it was just personalized through the individual? And perhaps the answer to something like that would be, oh, just speculation is that they just psychedelics chose the right person and maybe this is what prophets are they're able to interpret it from a place of putting their subjectivity aside and making it a little bit more broad or perhaps they'll be impacted by these big events as well and that may be what it's being filtered through but either way i think it's interesting how people can have a psychedelic experience relay it and then a bunch of other people feel uh, like it's going to occur for them, even though it was a very subjective way in which the message was received anyway. It's just all interpretational, man. Uh, yeah, it's interpretation and communication. Uh, and if you have a big vocabulary and understand things, you know, uh, more you know, clearly as a result of the work you've already done, you can be more effective in expressing and you know, communicating uh, what you've gone through. It could be with art as well, but you know, verbally you could write it down, you can talk about it, um, you know, people can chew on it together. That's the thing about these two, it's so difficult to articulate, and you've already brought it up here, but that's what's so interesting is that you can integrate, you feel it, and it sticks with you, but it's so hard to articulate. I always bring up that, that joke about this amazing, beautiful horse that's a painting, and then somebody says, my trip, and then the other, uh, how I describe my trip picture is like a My Little Pony, like horribly duct taped to the end of a 
a railing on stairs or something like that. So it falls so short of articulation. And these are experiences that need to be experienced, felt, and integrated in that way, which is so fascinating to me, man. Well, I think we ought to at least you know, try to use words. I mean, we can get uh, you know closer and closer to the experience using words. We can't convey you know the feeling uh, inside with words entirely, but you can approximate it. You know, there's poetry. Um, there's uh, you know, there's there's grammar. Uh, there's um, you know, there's language. It is true to a certain extent that the psychedelic experience is sometimes what they call ineffable. Uh, you, you, it can't be described in words. But you, you know, like you were saying with those you know, paintings, uh, you can't really describe anything in words. I, I mean, what can you describe in words? I guess you know, mathematics, but. Um, every other you know, part of existence is just an approximation. You know, so even though the enormity of a psychedelic experience or its novelty you know, kind of strains your vocabulary, that you know, doesn't mean you should just say it's ineffable. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think we can uh, work, you know, work harder in that regard. A great, great point. Yes, you might just be inarticulate. You know, maybe you thought about that. Uh, good call. Uh, okay, so I had a friend of mine. He's a phenomenal artist. He does the Value Added Project on Instagram, named Josh Smith. He and I were chatting a little bit earlier, and um, both of us actually have this question for you. There's one I had for you anyway, but he was asking it intent intentionally, and so I would like to on his behalf as well. So what do you think about the idea that when you go to a psychedelic experience and you're in what's, you know, unarguably a different realm, uh, especially with the DMT experience, some ayahuasca's as well, and if you take some heroic doses, you are in a different world. Our question to you is, is that a different world? Um, well, it, it feels like a different world. And that may mean it is, or that may mean it, it just feels that way. Uh, so I think the jury is still out. I mean, I speculated toward the end of my DMT book about dark matter, parallel universes, those kinds of things. Um, Whitley Stryber, the author of Communion, one of the first abduction books, um, Whitley and I, uh, or, you know, Whitley interviewed me. That was one of the earliest interviews after the Spirit Molecule came out. And, uh, you know, he was uh, thinking that, you know, DMT allowed access to a completely, you know, different level of, um, of reality as well. Um, so, you know, we just don't have the information. We just don't have the data. Um, you know, we don't have the instruments that could confirm or refute the idea that we are experiencing a, uh, a you know, different level of objective reality, uh, like, you know, dark matter, uh, for example. Uh, so um, we can't really prove it one way or the other. And that being the case, um, my feeling about that is that if we can't really decide or if we can't really determine it, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, the more important thing is uh, we live in this world most of the time. It has certain a certain uh, a system of cause and effect, uh, which influences us and influences everything around us. So, I think it's the uh, information that we can glean from that state, rather than wondering if it's uh, you know a real state or simply you know our brain on drugs. It's a if, you know, it's an you know, subjective correlate of changed activity of the brain. Um, yeah, I think our experiences ought to make us better people, ought to increase the chances of world peace. I think you know, that's uh, the most important thing. Um, and at some point, we will figure out where those worlds reside. Um, but in the meantime, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Could not agree more, man. But you're out there doing the work, and we're right here with you, brother. So, and thank you for what you're doing for the movement, honestly. Uh, you're just doing an incredible, incredible job. You know, because whenever we talk about these altered states and this uh, other world and these realms and these machine elves, you know, that are reported quite often in these different entities, physical or maybe not physical, but 
they look physical to the people experiencing it, these beings that they are having interactions, insightful conversations with and all of this stuff. Then my mind goes automatically to the U.S. government taking your work and research about intravenous sustained DMT trips and having soldiers, basically an underground bunker full of soldiers laying out in a room on these extended trips out there communicating as either ambassadors or taking over these realms. You know, I mean, that, that is just where my mind goes with it. Now, I would like something where we all hang out and we all can maybe go to these places and visit if it was more of, like you said, an objective an, – an, opportunity for an objective experience some we can share yeah you well you aren't alone in your concerns uh a few years ago alex jones uh invited me you know to be on his show and i declined and you know, then uh a few months later um i heard that um he was claiming you know that the elites were smoking dmt and the aliens were telling them what to do um, so, uh, yeah, it's a possibility. I mean, you, you know, my Zen teacher used to say it's always 51, 49, uh, you know, 51% good, 49% bad or evil, I think is the more potent term. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's up to us to keep things on the up and up. Yeah, I kind of tend to view this thing as <clears throat> it's just like in Star Wars. It, you you only experience what you take with you. And so I think the in-depthness of our psyche is really what's kind of being explored there. And it's something that not a lot of people are willing to do. They're they're fine with their real housewives of whatever and just baseline. And that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's value in that in this experience. But in my mind, it seems just a little bit extra. And it seems like you can really gain a lot of insight because people have done some amazing work on themselves, healing trauma, as you said, you know, and those sites of uh, those instances of extrasensory perception, whenever we drop into those, you plant these little seeds of trauma out there, and then you come back to baseline when you're not tripping. Well, something like an ayahuasca experience can offer you the opportunity to reach that hypersensitivity again, to be able to dig those things out and, and integrate them in a way that you weren't able to before. So I find it very valuable. Yeah, yeah, I would... Yeah, I th I think in the right hands with the right intention, the right you know, set and setting and dose. Yeah, I mean they can be extraordinarily helpful in ways that other things, you know, cannot. Um, one of my volunteers, when he was coming out of his DMT trip, he said, "Oh, you know, can't you get here with meditation?" And I laughed at him. I said, "Try it." Yeah. So, uh, you know the. The you know, pharmacology is a lot more reliable, a lot more consistent. Um, it takes you to places, you know, uh, which are very hard to get to otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of 30 years of meditation and Wim Hof breathing to access that DMT you got in you to trip for like one second. Yeah, I've done it. Th this. Yeah. Just take the shortcut, man. You know, come experience it. And then you got more work to do here. So you don't have to invest all that time into the practice. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I've been thinking about the whole, you know, enlightenment by a you know, psychedelic uh, idea in you know, spiritual uh, you know, traditions. A big enlightenment experience is just you know confirmation that you're on the right path. Mm. Um, it isn't like the reward or the goal or the accomplishment as much as the beginning of your real serious work. Um, you know, my Zen teacher used to say, you know, once you've had your first enlightenment experience, uh, you know, that's when the work begins. You know, so it isn't like you, you know, have a huge experience and you're done. It ought to be, or it is within a, a you know, spiritual tradition that once you've had that experience, you know, then is, uh, you know, when you're more committed and more involved with the path. Yeah, that's the real dragon you're chasing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, one final question for you, sir, and I'm, I'm truly grateful for your time here, Rick. This is amazing. Uh, so we'd mentioned uh, McKenna earlier, his stoned ape theory out of his <laughs> of the God's book. What are your thoughts on it? You know, it's a great idea. Uh, you know, psilocybin increases visual acuity. It uh, stimulates the growth of new neurons, stimulates the complexity of connections among neurons. Um, you know, if you're making sounds, you can hear sounds, um, and, you know, you can manipulate, uh, you know, visions with 
the sounds you make, which is an interesting way of looking at you know, the origin of speech as a you know, communicative uh, tool and uh, you know, the development of language uh, as kind of laying down speech more permanently. Um, you know, it's a good theory. I'm not an anthropologist. Uh, I don't know if there's any evidence to support it. Uh, it. It is clear there's a long history of, uh, you know, psychedelic use in Africa, you know, Northern Africa, at least going back maybe 8,000, 7,000 years or so. Um, you know, so, you know, whether it goes back um, as far as the evolution of non-human primates into human primates. Uh, yeah, I can't really comment. It gets support from uh, you know, people, you know, but I don't know how much support. I think it's an unfalsifiable and provable. I just think that, you know, he, even even McKenna says this. It's just that man's brain doubled, and this is probably, you know, he lays out a very uh, plausible scenario. And so, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. But like you said, I mean, it's, it's interesting, but I, I just think it's fun. I think it's a really, really interesting way to look at it. Yeah, yeah, it is fun. It's you know something that you talk about when you're stoned. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so you know whenever you're out in Texas, we'll take some mushrooms. We'll go sit down by the pond and we can talk about all this stuff. That'd be a lot of fun, man. Well, uh, Dr. Rick Strassman, I can't thank you enough. This has been incredible. You're of course welcome back any damn time. Just keep up the great work. The psychedelic handbook and all the ways to find him will be located down in the show notes. You guys make sure that you check it out. Thank you so much, man. This was awesome. Great. Well, many thanks. Pleasure. Just want to take a moment and thank Dr. Rick Strassman for coming by and hanging out with us. All of the ways to find him as well as his new book, The Psychedelic Handbook, will be located down in the show notes. Make sure that you all check that out. Also in the show description, check out our resource links. We have Food Forest Abundance, Get Your Freedom From Fear On, Opus, the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support. If you are interested in starting your own podcast, there is a link down there that reads Start Your Own Podcast, and that's a damn good place to start. Also, if you really want to step your game up in life in general, the Manifestor's Guide, Dewey Taylor, has a special scholarship offer for you, the listener of This Right Here. And at checkout, if you type in Expanding Reality, all caps, no spaces, he sweetens the deal even more. So definitely check that out if that's something that you're into. All right. uh, Also, stay tuned after this, guys. Uh, My announcement at the beginning of the show here, documentary that I'm in, Darcy Weir's new one, Secret Space UFOs, NASA's First Missions. We're going to play the trailer right after this, so you guys stay tuned. It's unbelievable, incredibly cool opportunity. Darcy, I love you, man. This is a badass experience and incredibly cool film. It's his best one yet. I mean, I've, I've been a fan of Darcy's for a long time, and I'm not biased because I'm in this. I would have said it if I wouldn't. This is an awesome, awesome doc, and he did a wonderful job. So stay tuned for that trailer. Link is in the description if you guys want to check it out. It's over on Amazon, so just go check it out. All right, guys, go out into this magically beautiful, mysterious place, whatever the hell this thing is, and y'all pick up a piece of litter. Uh, get, you know, get right with yourself and make sure that you have your garden tended. You know, that's where you start, and then maybe look around at everything else. Just kind of want to throw that in there. Also, while you guys are doing that, uh, buy somebody in line around you a coffee or a meal, something very, very small, goes a massively far away. And of course, get out of the left-hand lane. You got somebody behind you wanting to pass. That is an incredibly amazing way to instantly change the vibe on this place is just by being mindful of things like that. So that's why I say it. Plus, it's a huge pet peeve of mine. So I'm working on everybody getting out of the left-hand lane. You got somebody behind you wanting to pass there. Uh, Okay, and also, above all, and anything else, guys, go out into this incredibly amazing place, whatever the hell this thing is, and y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for listening, for watching, for engaging, and just being the coolest sons of bitches ever. We'll see you next time. possible to keep a secret on something as extraordinary as real UFOs. Are you kidding? NASA, they would love, or SETI, they would love to announce such a finding to the world. 
In NASA, for example, they've had classified connections there its entire existence. Speed, Mach 6, 4,104 miles an hour. The highest and fastest a winged aircraft has ever flown. Understood that there had to be a law established to protect the public and therefore the people. How the development of, for example, black budget types of structures evolved in the 1940s and 50s, frequently connected with the UFO phenomenon. The saga of the X-15 and its pilots is marked at the White House as the four men who have piloted the plane received the famed Collier Trophy that is awarded for noted contributions to aviation. Presidents may not have the need to know on the UFO subject. It's like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around the little, they're coming by the capsule. Prove that man could fly into orbit around the Earth and return live and well to talk about it. I just want to quickly go over some of the photographic proof and evidence directly from the NASA archive. Now, one of the major mission goals for our astronauts in space was to take pictures. That's the simple truth. On Gemini 4, Ed White became the first American to make an extravehicular activity, EVA, or spacewalk. Now, due to the fact that NASA reported many mission photos or mission picture archives as lost or destroyed, the public would have been completely in the dark had it not been for the declassification of these incredible VTR transcript documents. Are there any other things from your Gemini mission that, and they specifically want you to tell, maybe things that weren't in your book countdown? 